So we are agreed that one of us is to assume father's name and titles. Seven heads bowed in assent. There were seven men in the room, all remarkably similar in build and appearance. Each had a strong chin and an aristocratic face. Each was dressed in finery far too warm for the Castilian knight. Outside, voices cried out in Spanish and Portuguese, merchants hawking their wares, their wines, their women. The voices floated in through a single window, as did the light of the sliver of moon to the west. If it becomes common knowledge that our sire has been destroyed, the consequences will be unpleasant. It will give hope to the Anarchs and their puppet masters. It will cause some of our younger brethren to defect to their cause for fear of our weakening. And it will cause division in the councils of our father's peers, delaying the unification of the clans. I find all of these to be undesirable results. The speaker was, perhaps, the eldest of the seven gathered. He sat in a tall chair cushioned in red, its legs carved like lion's claws and gilded. The others sat in smaller, lower seats. One of those, seated closest to the window, spoke. But which? And what steps to ensure the secrecy of the matter? Should the charade be exposed, the damage will be worse than if we just admit to father's destruction. The eldest shrugged slightly. I had thought that, being closest to father in age and power, there were some murmuring at this, that I would become him, so to speak, and that I would rely on our bond of shared lineage to ensure your silence. The others looked around, eyes meeting as each silently tested his brother's resolve to mount a challenge. Then came the babble of reassurances that, yes, of course, they would be a part of this plan. Your show of solidarity is touching, brothers, if you will excuse me for a moment. And the eldest child of Hardestat rose and walked to the door of the library which a ghoul servant once in the service of the Knights Templar held open for him. Behind him, he heard the clatter of metal goblets against the wooden tabletop as his brethren reached for the refreshments he'd had set out hours past. Each cup contained a mix of the vitae of various powerful and ancient canites, all long since destroyed by Hardestat the Younger. Each also contained some of Hardestat's own vitae, masked by the headier flavors of elder blood. This was not the first time Hardestat had assayed such a subterfuge. Bending a wine steward's will was an easy matter for one of Hardestat's power. Silence would be assured, yes. Before the Camarilla, there was no sect amongst vampires. Each city would be ruled by a prince, the strongest and craftiest canite among the population and they would bend the knee to no one save perhaps their seniors, the Methuselah, and even antediluvians, playing their eternal jihad. Few were those places where a Canite would rule over more than a handful of cities, and any vampire powerful enough to lay claim to an entire kingdom would surely be a power to fear. One of these princes was Hardestat. A Ventru elder embraced in the 10th century and of a distinctly low generation. This nobleman would rule over the thieves of the Black Cross, a feudal monarchy under Germanic rule with an iron fist, dividing his domain into smaller ones that he would entrust to those Ventru loyal to him, enforcing his dominion and providing ample protection against the Tsimitsi, La Sombra, Toriador, or even other Ventru who would oppose them. Hardestat knew well the danger of what revealing their true nature to mortals would entail, and would punish any who did so with impunity. He would travel his domain frequently, keeping court in no single place, and would entrust favored childer with important tasks, in a sense resembling the emperor kings of the time. Eventually, however, the Ventru lord would come to see the threat of not only the mortals and their inquisition, but of the younger generation of kindred as well. 
While he remained quite confident in his own progeny and their loyalty to him, he heard through Jürgen, his favored child, that there was a great disarray amongst the Tsimitsi, who would fight each other as well as the Ventru. Other clans as well were developing schisms between the young and the old, and the Bruja revolutionary Robin Leland of England was causing trouble for the local lords, even giving Mithras himself problems. Thus Hardestat had the idea of forming a coalition, a sect meant not only to enforce a strict set of laws that would protect the Cainites from exposing themselves to the mortals, but also ensure that only the oldest would be allowed to dictate who had the hunting rights, the rights to sire, and the rights to kill another Cainite. Needless to say, his ideas were met with skepticism at first, yet he would amass a small group of like-minded individuals and, calling themselves the Founders, they set out to establish support for this new sect. Yet in 1395, Tyler, child of Robin Leland, participated in an assault against a Ventru castle in western Spain. There, she diabolized Hardestat, who had been wounded from fighting off the Anarchs. Shocked by the aggression of these upstarts, the elders of many clans decided that there perhaps was some merit in Hardestat's idea. Yet before they could pursue it any further, the man himself appeared once more, claiming boldly that Tyler had failed in destroying him. In truth, he had merely been replaced by one of his childer, yet the ruse was successful. In a swoop, support for this new Camarilla sword and the legitimacy granted to the founders allowed them to take a more active role in the politics of the Canines of Europe. One such step was the attempt to prevent the diablery of Japheth and his sire Cappadocius, yet they failed in this. Even so, through clever scheming, they managed to convince the fledgling clan Giovanni to swear an oath not to involve themselves in the affairs of other clans, which they have, up until this day, mostly held. The gangrel Hassan al-Samhir, a feared warrior, also swore fealty to Hardestat at the beginning of the 15th century and took the name Karsh, becoming the first, and even tonight, only warlord of the Camarilla. This show of loyalty helped convince some who would have otherwise held little to no sympathy for the pompous Ventru. During the Convention of Thorns, Hardestat showed himself clearly, his bombastic, brusque way of speaking more intimidating than inspiring. Yet, as he survived another attempt at his life by the Anarch Tyler, support for his cause was obvious. It was helped along by the Torador Rafael de Corazon, and once the affairs were settled, seven clans had agreed to join the Ivory Tower. In the 18th century, Hardesat would come to embrace Jan Pierzon, a Dutchman, to help represent him in Camarilla matters. The fledgling survived this trial by fire only by the skin of his teeth, and would serve the Camarilla's founder loyally for years to come. Yet in the 20th century, he was appointed by his sire to lead the opposition against the Sabbat's offensive across the eastern sea border, and while it was primarily a failure, at least New York City was brought under control by the Camarilla. It is not known if Hardestat was on the inner circle of the Camarilla. It would certainly seem like a natural progression from his role as the founder of the sect. Yet despite his murder at the hands of Theobel, there have been no calls for his blood, no revenge has been meted out, and no name has been added to the Red List. At least not yet. Were the rest of the founders aware that Hardestat's child had picked up where his sire had left off once Tyler drained him, or were they fooled by the ruse? Was the inner circle? Was Peterson? Despite his very public profile, Hardeset ironically remains one of the most elusive of the open Camarilla's leadership, and with the man now dead, who knows if these secrets will ever come to light.